afternoon again. This is Board Chair Linda Chenya, and I'd like to welcome you all to the public board meeting of the Baltimore City School of School, Baltimore City Board of School Commissioners. Um, just a reminder to uh, folks listening in to be sure to mute your phone. Uh, I'm going to start with a roll call uh, to identify which board members are on the call. And a reminder to board members that we continue, um, even though I believe I have a video, please um, identify yourselves as we go, as you are ready to speak. So let's um, see who's here. I see Commissioner Bondima. Yes. Commissioner Brooks. Commissioner Brooks. Yes, yes. Okay. Commissioner Frank. Okay. Commissioner James. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner McFadden. Commissioner, I see Commissioner Reed. Commissioner Richardson. Commissioner Roberts. Commissioner uh, Sykes. And I am here. Okay. So I have, I'm counting five. Uh, am I correct? Um, Board exec? Yes, although Commissioner McFadden is having, uh, we're texting, he's having some tech issues, so he'll be joining momentarily. Oh, uh, okay. All righty. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to reopen the meeting? So moved, Bandima. Commissioner Bandima, is there a second? Second, James. Thank you. Okay, and all those in favor, Commissioner Bondim, are you in favor of reopening? Yes, yes. Thank you. Commissioner Brooks? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner James? Yes. Commissioner, uh, okay, has Commissioner Frank joined or McFadden? Okay. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Um, does Commissioner Richardson join? Okay. Commissioner Roberts, I see you. Are you in favor of reopening? Uh, Commissioner Roberts, are you in favor of reopening? Okay, I see Commissioner Frank. Are you in favor of reopening? Yes. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Sykes. Okay. I'm in favor. Uh, did Commissioner McFadden rejoin us? I don't know if you all can hear me, but I'm completely knocked out of, of all of everything. So can you hear me? Okay, we can hear you. Are you in in favor of rejoining? I am. Or reopening the meeting. I'm sorry, not rejoining. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I have um, seven in favor. I'm I'm on to Commissioner oh. Chenya Richardson. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have eight in favor. And um, am I counting this correctly? One absent? That's not correct. We, did we get Commissioner Frank's uh, vote? Yes. yes. Okay, I believe that's nine and one. You're right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this motion passes. Thanks a lot. I'd like to take uh, time to recognize, unfortunately, the passing of uh, city school employees and um, students. And um, we know that they're going to all be remembered fondly by the greater city school community. And tonight we send our deepest condolences to their friends and families. Um, Dr. Ann Osborne Emery was one of the most beloved and venerated educators of the Baltimore City Public School System. And she has died. She was 93. Her career in public school education spanned several decades from Louisiana to Maryland. 
Right. And during the course of her career as a teacher and school administrator, she positively impacted the lives of thousands of young people. She all uh, that she that all refer to her, or she referred to them as her children. Dr. Emery was born um, May 15, 1927, in Thomasville, Alabama. She moved to Baltimore with her husband. Um, and their three sons after, successful, after a successful teaching career in Louisiana. She attended what was then Morgan State College where she earned a master's degree in education and then attend, attended Temple University in Philadelphia where she was awarded a doctorate degree in education. Dr. Emery served as the vice principal of Lamell Junior High School in West Baltimore in the 1960s and early 1970s, before moving on to become principal of Walbrook High School. She later helped to found the Bluford Jameson STEM Academy. And uh, Dr. Emery also provided leadership and service for decades with her involvement in several groups and organizations, including the Baltimore Chapter of 100 Black Women, the Baltimore City Commission for Women, and the Tuskegee National Alumni association. Judith Dixon and Dixon uh, passed away on Sunday, June 21st, 2020. Judy was born in Baltimore and um, has one daughter. She was uh, and also a granddaughter. Judith had a passion for helping others and teaching children. She earned a master's degree and was an educator and principal at James McHenry Elementary and other schools in the system for over 30 years. Um, she loves spending time with her grandchild, and she will be lovingly missed by her family and many friends. Angela Seaton began her career with city schools as a special education teacher in 1972 until becoming an ARD manager in 1984. After joining city school central office staff as an ARD chairperson in 1993, she transitioned several times with each position earning additional responsibilities and respect until ultimately becoming the principal of Francis M. Wood High School, from which she retired in 2013. During retirement, she often used her extraordinary educational experience to assist former co-workers by taking on short-term assignments, such as the adjunct professor, um, and clinical supervisor at Coppin State University, along with acting director and other administrative assignments for city school. Angela used her educational proficiencies to enrich the lives of thousands of city school students and their families. In addition to these same experiences, uh, they also influenced her to become an exemplary uh, person and example for her family, co-workers, and many friends. It's with deep regret that we inform you of the passing of Janelle Robinson, who served in city schools for 12 years as a teacher at Yorkwood Elementary. Ms. Robinson unfortunately departed on June 30, 2020, and will be missed greatly by her family, friends, and city schools. We also inform you of the passing of Shannon Riviera, who served in city schools for 17 years as a psychologist at Gardenville Elementary. Ms. Riviere unfortunately departed on August 12, 2020, and she will also be missed by her family, friends, and city schools. Junior Molina Damus was a rising senior at National Foundation in Baltimore. He went through a metamorphosis during the past two years and transformed into an amazing student leader who supported ESOL students and worked with staff to make NAF a great place to learn. Unfortunately, his life was accidentally cut short during a family outing at Kadora State Park where he drowned while swimming with his family. He loved soccer, helping others and coordinating events through his hospitality pathway. Junior was loved by many and will be missed by his family, friends, and the entire NAF community. May I ask that we take a moment of silence remembering all of these folks who were a great part of our city school system. Thank you. 
And now is um, is there a motion to approve the open the prior open um, session minutes? So moved, Richardson. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Brooks. Thank you. And those in favor, Commissioner Bondima. Commissioner Bondima, are you in favor? <laughs> yes. Okay, Commissioner Brooks. Yes. Commissioner Frank. Yes. Commissioner uh, James. Yes. McFadden. Yes. Commissioner Reed. Yes. Richardson. Yes. Roberts. Yes. Commissioner Sykes. Okay, I'm in favor. And there are no, no one opposed abstain. So that is nine in favor and one absent. The motion carries. Now is there a motion um, to approve the closed session summaries? So moved, Bandima. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Richardson. Second. Okay. Thank you. And those in favor? Uh, Commissioner Bondima? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Frank? Yes. James? Yes. McFadden? Yes. Reed? Yes. Richardson? Yes. Uh, Roberts? Yes. Okay, I'm in favor. That's nine in favor. Um, and no one opposed, so that's this motion also passes. So thank you. Uh, this evening, as part of the uh, board chair comments, I'd like to acknowledge um, several new members of the Parent Community Advisory Board, PCAP, um, Angie Winder, Melissa Schober, Kiara Davis Griffin, and Jack. Schiller, uh, welcome aboard. We look forward to working with you. I also want to congratulate the new PCAB Executive Committee. Cha uh, the chair is Joe Kane, Vice Chair Linnea Cornish, Secretary Rachel Duncan, and Treasurer Larry Simmons. I uh, also want to congratulate Ms. Uh, Winifred Winston and Mr. Mike Benoit on their elections as chair and vice chair, respectively, of the uh, Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, CCAC. We appreciate your partnership and look forward to working with you as well. And now I have uh, the pleasure of recognizing uh, retirees with over 30 years of service. I believe that Mr. Augustus Harrington is on. Um, Mr. Harrington, hopefully you're there. Are you there, sir? Okay. Well, um, he began working with the Baltimore City Public Schools on September the 1st, uh, 1986. He most recently served as the assistant principal of Carver Academy. Um, Mr. Harrington faithfully served the children of Baltimore City for 44 years. So congratulations. We also want to recognize Cassandra Edwards, um, who served Baltimore City Schools for 31 years and 10 months. Uh, she um, retired. Her last uh, assignments were included Vanguard and Digital Harbor High School. Uh, we recognize Odetta, I'm sorry, uh, Oretta Drake, sorry, who served for 34 years and five months, uh, who um, Served at um, as a non-instructional assistant at the at the same location uh, at Northwood Elementary for her entire time. Susan Penn uh, is another retiree who served Baltimore City Schools for 40 years and five months, uh, retiring from William Packer. And Victor. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my glasses tonight. Victor Sisson uh, retired after 45 years and one month, 
um, he, he, which he served the school system. He completed his career at Eager Street Academy. And last but not least, we also want to acknowledge Laurel Delaney, who served Baltimore City Schools for 31 years and 10 months as a special educator. Uh, she, um, she retired, I believe, from Digital Harbor, but she also served, no, her final assignment was at Waverly Elementary School. So congratulations to all of these folks. We hope that you will enjoy uh, your retirement. We thank you for, the, for all of the service that you provided uh, for our students. And uh, the last thing that I'd like to do is uh, to, uh, on behalf of the board, just to acknowledge that we have been, uh, we have received um, uh, petitions from several folks, uh, uh, only when safe petition. Uh, we do want you to know that as board members, uh, we, we have read these and we do listen. We will continue um, to offer opportunities for the community uh, to share ideas and concerns. And we will also promise you that we will continue our very strong collaboration with many folks to uh, try to address some of the issues that you've mentioned. And, and, and our collaboration will be with both our local, state and federal representatives, leaders and legislators, um, also our partners in advocacy. Um, we also have uh, collaborations with uh, philanthropic supporters, with community organizations, um, uh, with some of our local sc other schools uh, and colleges and universities. And so we want to encourage everyone, including the folks who have sent, uh, have signed the petition to really join in um, an important area of advocacy. And that is going to be around funding because many of the issues that were brought out in the petition are, are really going to hinge on uh, having the adequate funding to provide uh, what we know should be uh, adequate educational opportunities for all of our students. Uh, this is going to be an important year, given uh, both uh, the fact that the current legislation was not signed off on, as well as the um, impact that we've had from the corona virus. And so it is going to be important that we stay together in collaboration uh, to support and to remind all of, of the folks who make decision, decisions about the importance of having the kinds of funds that we need uh, to, to support the work that we need to do. With that, I'm going to see uh, ask if there is a motion um, to approve the personnel employment payroll, the PEP agenda. So moved, Richardson. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Brooks. Thank you. Um, uh, just just to let folks remind folks that I, I I have separated the two pieces because we need to have a vote for one of them. So um, those in favor, uh, and this is for the PEP agenda, uh, Commissioner Bandina. Yeah, yes. Brooks? Yes. Commissioner Frank? Yes. James? Yes. McFadden? Yes. Reed? Yes. Richardson? Yes. Roberts? Yes. And I'm in favor, so that's nine in favor, no abstentions, and no opposed. And now is there a motion? Um, to approve uh, the quasi-judicial matter. So moved, Brooks. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Richardson. Thank you. Uh, those in favor, uh, Commissioner Bondima? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Frank? Yes. McFadden? Yes. Reed? Yes. Richardson? Yes. Roberts? Yes. Okay, I'm in favor. Are there any opposed or any abstentions? James, abstending? Ab abstending? Thank you. 
<laughs> I'm abstaining. <laughs> okay, <laughs> abstaining. I'm sorry. Okay, so we have uh, eight in favor, one abstain, and uh, this motion also passes. Thank you. So I'm now going to turn um, over to Dr. Santelisis uh, for CEO comments. Thank you, Commissioner Tenia. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, this will be our last board meeting uh, prior to the opening of school on September 8th. And so I wanted to uh, take this opportunity um, to review some important information for our families and students. I am very excited uh, for the start of school, um, even though it will be the first time um, for Baltimore City Schools that we will be opening 100% virtually. Um, and I do want to emphasize that all students um, are still uh, required to um, fulfill uh, the immunization requirements as we pre prepare to re-enter um, by the first day of school. This is a, a state department uh, requirement. Uh, city health department is partnering with us to make sure um, that all of our children, your children, are protected. Um, the Rails Clinic um, at Kitt Baltimore um, is also providing this year immunizations to all BCPS students, um, but both there and through the city health department, uh, just keep in mind that they do require advanced appointments um, and that appointments are available from eight to five um, on weekends. Um, City Schools is also this year uh, offering online registration for all students in all grades this year. Um, so if you haven't yet enrolled your student, please do so um, as soon as possible uh, by visiting our City Schools webpage and clicking on the registration uh, link. Uh, for those with limited technology access, um, In-person enrollment will still be available uh, by, in, uh, by appointment. Uh, please email or call to set up a convenient time. Um, but I do want to emphasize for those who can, uh, we are finding that the online registration process um, is in fact much faster. Um, now, and in speaking uh, about online, uh, city schools um, continues to be committed to provide students with the devices that they need to participate um, in virtual learning this school year. Um, families may obtain laptops and internet hotspots if needed um, for their students directly from their schools. Uh, we are beginning that process, have begun that process this week, um, but please uh, note that um, you should, after you've contacted your school about um, your desire for a device, the school will then um, let you know at their site when it will be available. Uh, we have really worked to make sure um, that uh, we will have a device available for every student, but please know um, that there is also some international challenges around delivery um, of devices for schools. Um, across the country. So we may have um, some delay, uh, but just a shout out to the team uh, for locating um, kind of emergency uh, procurements of devices in the face of this international challenge. But families, uh, the major message is to contact your school directly uh, about need, and then they will contact you um, about um, when in fact um, you can pick up your devices. Um, as you know, based on the current uh, COVID progression, uh, we continue to um, confer with the city health department, with our health advisory team. Um, and so we have uh, decided to delay uh, that start of in-person learning. Uh, but again, um, school will officially open um, on September 8th. And families should note uh, that uh, attendance will be taken daily um, as we begin the new school year and as we really 
um, move to implement uh, additional st uh, structures and supports based on our learning uh, from uh, from the school year uh, in the spring. Um, I also want to invite uh, everyone to review Closing the Distance, which is our plan uh, for reopening Baltimore City Schools this fall. Uh, you can find the plan. It's available on our website, and it is filled with information uh, that will answer your questions and help families uh, prepare students for success. Um, the district uh, will continue uh, to plan for uh, some small in-person um, opportunities uh, for learning, um, but please make sure that you stay tuned um, to our website in contact with your school, um, and we will absolutely be sure, as promised, to update you on uh, future steps within the fall um, by mid-October. Um, but in the meantime, we are looking forward to a uh, more enriched and engaging virtual learning experience uh, based on our learning um, from some of our um, uh, model teachers, as well as from families and feedback from young people um, themselves. I'm going to take a brief pause in my comments right now and ask Chief Grant Skinner, uh, for this evening's PEP agenda, and then I will return um, after the PEP Chief Grant Skinner. Thank you, President Lisa Asen. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, we have nine appointments this evening, um, and except for a couple where I will know otherwise, they are all effective tomorrow, August 26th. Uh, first, Carolyn Rason Fernandez, Educational Specialist 2, um, is appointed Coordinator for Specialized Instruction. Monique Smith, a social worker, is appointed Educational Specialist to Student Wholeness, uh, effective August 31st. Anitra Washington, uh, Educational Associate at Western High School, is appointed Assistant Principal at Western. Jacqueline Giddens, uh, Director of Teaching and Learning at the Bel Air Edison School, is appointed Assistant Principal at the Bel Air Edison School. Kimberly Davis, elementary teacher at Furman Templeton Preparatory Academy, is appointed assistant principal at Furman Templeton. Samuel Coffey, elementary teacher at Rosemont Elementary Middle School, is appointed assistant principal at Rosemont. Monica Campbell, educational associate at Baltimore Montessori Public Charter School, is appointed assistant principal at Baltimore Montessori. Uh, Theodore Spain, assistant principal at the William S. Bear School, is reassigned assistant principal at Joseph C. Briscoe Academy. And Jane Ehrenfeld, legal consultant, is appointed or was appointed director of fair practices and compliance um, effective today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Grant Skinner, uh, for uh, this evening's PEP agenda and congratulations um, to everyone uh, who's either joining city schools or continuing with city schools in a new role. Thank you, Chief. Um, starting tomorrow, uh, teachers and 10-month staff uh, will return uh, to provide uh, additional time for high quality professional learning um, and really to make sure um, that there are additional learning opportunities and time to acquire skills and tools um, to really have uh, more robust learning than uh, we were able to provide in the fall given, uh, excuse me, in the spring, um, given the short notice and the quick turnaround time. Um, as part of our commitment uh, to support school uh, readiness, any school-based staff directly related to instruction who need a computer for instruction uh, should notify their school administrator and a computer will be provided. Um, it was good to see and to have um, educators uh, beginning on Monday um, who are coming up, uh, picking up devices um, and, uh, and giving uh, great feedback along the way. So please make sure that you notify your school um, 
if you are a teacher or a, an educator directly related to instruction so that we can make sure you have a computer. Um, I also want to give a huge shout out uh, to Laura Hanian and more than 50 staff who all volunteered, and I want to um, emphasize that, uh, to participate in our very successful um, in-person summer learning program. Uh, we had, um, thanks to all of you, um, 200 students who were most impacted by distance learning, uh, meaning young people who um, either were unengaged, did not connect, um, had low engagement during the spring, benefited um, from in-person in -person engagement in small groups in July and August. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your leadership, dedication to our students, and real commitment um, to helping us uh, learn um, what school and teaching and learning can look like uh, in this new environment. So thank you to all of you. Um, at the same time, um, I have been uh, receiving and reading uh, feedback regarding our plans for virtual learning. Um, as we launch, uh, we are committed to remaining open uh, for feedback uh, throughout the fall. I do know that there are some um, who feel that our decision to uh, conduct online live slash synchronous learning uh, with teachers five days a week um, is asking too much from both teachers and students. Um, and I absolutely do realize that we are asking a lot from our teachers, which is one of the reasons um, that we've scheduled the eight days of professional learning prior to the arrival on September 8th. Uh, we heard from large numbers of teachers the need, um, and rightly so, um, to have greater opportunity to develop their skills there, uh, get acclimated um, to this uh, uh, new environment. And so we are working uh, very hard to ensure that our teachers have the appropriate equipment and training um, to deliver high quality virtual learning um, to our students, um, including um, our most vulnerable student groups, many of whom um, really uh, did not benefit in the spring, but that we want to benefit uh, from virtual instruction and the fact that we really do need to get this uh, right this fall. Um, we should also bear in mind um, that our students um, are among those making um, a number of sacrifices, uh, families uh, making uh, frontline sacrifices to protect communities during this uh, crisis. So we really um, believe that it is important that we remember that our most vulnerable students, especially our black and brown students, um, are most in danger of being left behind, really by this unprecedented um, interruption in their schooling. Um, we are asking students to sacrifice the in-learning opportunities and experiences, activities um, from which uh, they normally would have benefited. Um, so it is our collective obligation to deliver a virtual learning series of opportunities um, that effectively engage our young people, uh, nurture their curiosity, foster their academic success, and provide opportunities for social connectedness. Um, and we know that we have the seeds in some of the practice of um, our very talented educators um, who really led um, in the spring with very engaging, continuous uh, teaching of, of new material throughout the spring. And so we must be sure um, that we meet both the social emotional needs and the academic support that our young people need. And that can only be accomplished by providing them uh, with as much quality time and instruction as, impo as possible um, with, with the teachers who know them and care for them. Um, so yes, it is vital that we provide daily synchronous learning environment for our students um, that will meet their needs. Um, recent studies project potentially significant learning loss when students received even average remote learning in the spring and much larger losses when they received low quality remote learning. Um, and it is projected that the learning loss would probably be greater for low income, black and 
Latino students. So we opted for more synchronous learning time with teachers to help prevent that learning loss. Uh, we believe our students deserve similar live instruction um, to what they might find in other schooling environments rather than less. In order to connect early on with our students who have told us overwhelmingly that connections to teachers, that regular touch point, the ability to ask questions um, and providing more in-depth supports in more structured learning environments has a positive impact on their learning. Uh, we know that the amount of course time provided to students in a virtual model um, is less than they would receive in an in-person model. And we will work to make sure um, that that time is not just students uh, spent uh, aimlessly in front of screens, but really bringing um, some of the creativity um, and focus and um, actual teaching support uh, that we saw in uh, a number of classrooms already. From the student perspective, prior to the onset of the pandemic this spring, the limited amount of distance learning they experienced in public education precluded significant research into appropriate screen time specific to synchronous instruction. In the absence of definitive research, we looked at best practice from other long-standing providers of distance learning with more than two decades of experience. In their models, students can spend anywhere from three to six hours daily in live instruction with additional asynchronous learning. I understand that it's not easy, um, but nothing that we have done together since March um, and least of all for their students and their families has been easy. We will continue to adapt and adjust as we need to best serve our students. There is no way we can make up for the loss of learning that occurred with schools closing in March without live instruction, which many students reported over and over that they needed and missed acutely this past spring. In summary, like many of our experiences under COVID, our school schedules and times identified for synchronous learning represent our review of best practice and available research as we now have it. We know that this information will continue to evolve um, as school systems across the country and schools across our district adapt to the current situation. We will absolutely continue to assess the efficacy of all of our practices through learning acquired as the year unfolds and make whatever adjustments are needed to accelerate student learning and wellness during this very challenging period. In the meantime, we will continue to focus on what is best for students. That concludes my remarks for this evening. Thank you, Chair Chinia. I will turn um, turn things over back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santalisis. Um, we have uh, one information and discussion item um, this evening, and we will actually have that presented uh, after public comment. So I just want folks, if you're checking the the, um, the schedule, our agenda, to, to note that. Uh, so at this point, we're going to. Oh, Commissioner Chenya. I was going to yeah. say, we have to wait until 6 for public comment, so I wasn't sure if we could uh, do LGB, uh, do the information oh, discussion well, item now. Staff was I, ready. Thank you. I wasn't looking. We, we also we have to review the consent agenda. We could do that as well. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I didn't hear the last. Oh, thing I'm sorry. We, we, we haven't we gone haven't over the consent. Jennifer, Jennifer will please be pulled. Oh. I'm still not. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not hearing. I, did I not hear. Madam Chair, uh, we haven't looked at the consent agenda for what items might want to be pulled. To I know that. That's okay. correct. I was. That's where I was heading. <laughs> Wait. That's why I thought you were going. That's why. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, the question was if we wanted to do the information first, and then I moved to that before public comment. So that that that's where I was because we have to wait until six o'clock anyway. For the public comment, so I, if if um, if the presenters are ready, I would suggest that we do the information um, item and discussion item, and that will give us that time. And then we'll then we'll, then we'll move into the consent agenda. 
Um, so can we do the presentation um, on city schools supporting the LGBTQ plus students and other stakeholders? Are those folks ready? We're ready. And Thank I think you. Thank I you. think Dr. Santelises wants to start. All right. Sure, thank you, um, uh, Josh, I will just say uh, directly, but thank you. Um, so uh, where we are now um, with regards to uh, what we are presenting um, is absolutely uh, the follow-up uh, to a lot of our discussions um, around policy, but also we'll touch on areas with regards for implementation um, as we look to uh, better support our LGBTQ students um, and other stakeholders. What you will see um, from our chief legal counsel, from Chief Sivan, um, is a walkthrough of the general areas and uh, target points um, and will be followed subsequently um, as an actual implementation plan. So what you will not see this evening uh, will be actual dates or timelines. Those will be forthcoming. Um, but tonight really is to provide uh, the Board of Commissioners and the public um, with an update on um, how we are moving with this work um, that Chief Sivan and his team are leading um, along with uh, cross-functional participation um, from different teams. Thank you, Chief Sivan. Thanks for those framing. And let's start with the first slide and wanted to start with policy JBB and acknowledge the board's work in April of 2019, really in the work leading up to that to ad adopt our and, and revise and update our policy on sex-based discrimination to confirm that city schools longstanding prohibition against sex-based discrimination also includes discrimination based on gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, and nonconformance to stereotypical notions of masculinity and or femininity. Um, the other key work in that policy is to clarify complaint and investigation procedures, and also to cover a number of key topics, ranging from dress codes to access to gender segregated facilities, to student records and athletics and physical education. So um, that was uh, the work in April. And I think that this presentation, if we switch to the next slide, really uh, is situated in policy and legal compliance. And this is a key moment for a lawyer to say, it's not just policy and legal compliance, but we're really trying to move beyond with the idea that we as city schools want to ensure robust compliance with our all our legal requirements and board policies, but also we want to put in place a framework that can mitigate complaints over the long run, really by building capacity to implement uh, safe and secure environments for all we serve generally, but particularly to this presentation in the LGBTQ plus community. And to that end, and really with the framing that Dr. Sandalisi has set out, um, we're working to establish a cross-functional team of both district staff and school-based staff, co-facilitated my, my office and the Office of Equity. And you may have uh, seen on the PEP agenda that uh, Jane Ehrenfeld is joining us as the new director of Fair Practices. She couldn't have come at a better moment because this work will be something that she spearheads and she's worked, um, started as a teacher, but also has worked at the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Education. So really brings that knowledge and energy to this work. Um, so, so this cross-functional team of offices and district staff and school-based staff wants to work to build out what we talk about in this presentation for key work streams for 2020-21 school year and beyond. And we want to, some of the key work that the committee will, the, the work team will do, the cross-functional work team will do, is to really make sure that the presentation here is a framework. It sets out key work streams, but we want to make sure that all of our work is informed by our stakeholders, starting with our students and moving behind to our students to other community advocate staff and stakeholders to ensure that we're flexible, nimble, and responsive enough to make sure that we're really meeting the needs of our community, 
um, starting with our students to promote that safe, secure, and healthy environment. And that is particularly important in the work we're doing to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Just some framing as we go to the next slide that our work in cities, oh, sorry, um, the key work streams that we'll get to, I started to jump, but the key work streams we'll get to um, are uh, the ones listed here. Um, lots of work cross uh, cr cross groups, various work groups. So these are the initial framing of them, but we can adjust these as we need. Both policy interpretation and implementation, student engagement, support and wholeness, staff, professional development, academics, data management, monitoring and communication, and facilities. And then to the next slide, um, we want to make sure just to situate for the board and particularly when we start with policy development and implementation that there's a broader legal context and a legal landscape out there. So as a lawyer, I had to go back to the law, but just um, a really important development was that the US Supreme Court ruled this term in a case uh, called Bostick that the prohibition against sex based employment discrimination covers LGBTQ plus employees. Um, very significant development by a court uh, in opinion authored by Justice Gorsuch. Then um, the US Department of Education has issued new regulations for Title IX, which prohibits sex based discrimination in K 12 schools and higher education. And you may have seen a number of court cases have been filed around these rules, and we're watching closely as they go through. And they may, as we go on, uh, require us to look again at the grievance procedures and the complaint procedures in our policies and regulations. And we will continue to update the board and the community about that to make sure that we're aligned with the regulations as they evolve and any court cases that come out of that. Then the final development, just to note as we're going through and you'll see how we're responding to it is that um, the Maryland State Department of Education has issued updates its student records manual, um, which really are helpful to clarify processes for students seeking name and gender changes based on gender identity. And off, also in line with uh, recent state law on driver's licenses, authorizing use of non-binary gender designations in school documents, including school enrollment documents. I'll come back to both of those points, but just again to be clear that the, there's a broader context informing our work, which we want to be responsive both to that broader context, but also what's happening on the ground here in Baltimore. So switch to the next slide. So in the slides that follow, we really talk about some key points on the various work streams that we identified. This is not meant to be all inclusive, but some key highlights, both in terms of current work and work for the future. Um, so um, a couple current points on the policy interpretation and implementation. We're working to strengthen the system wide Title IX coordinator role in the Office of Legal Counsel, which really makes sure that we are ensuring compliance with those federal laws that undergird our policy and regulation. We're also um, identifying a bullying, cyberbullying, and Title IX point of contact in every school and clarifying and ensuring that they have the support they need to have those roles. And so folks in schools will understand who that person is and they can reach out to them. Um, we've also provided important updates consistent with the policy to our non-discrimination statement on the website and in key publications so people really understand in plain language that there are a variety of important non-discrimination rules out there that protect all the members of our community including our LGBTQ plus community. And then I think that as we go forward, we also really want to make sure that we're streamlining the protocols that are used for reporting and investigating not just policy JVB complaints, but also complaints under related policies. We have another policy on bullying, harassment, or intimidation of students, and one on student non-discrimination. We want to ensure that for students, parents, and staff that um, when they have a concern, uh, it's accessible to make sure that the forms that exist are available and that there's no there's we limit and minimize the confusion among the various strands because what we really want to do regardless of who files what forms to make sure that concerns are raised elevated and promptly addressed 
And then um, ongoing work that I believe starts to come to the policy committee this fall is to update our employee related anti-discrimination policies to ensure that they align with the work previously done for the board on policy JVB that applies to students. So let's switch to the next slide. So now we're moving beyond the policy implementation really to what I emphasized early, really thinking about how we can uh, not just be ensuring that we are fully compliant with all laws and regulations, but really moving to a support focused approach to our work to ensure that in our work, we are moving step by step to put student health, safety and welfare of all students at the forefront of the work that we're doing. And so in the bullets that follow, focus first on our student engagement support and wholeness work, uh, you'll see some strands of that work emphasized as we move forward. One of those strands focuses on expanding the work that um, our wholeness unit does to prioritize creating a greater sense of student emotional safety and belonging focusing on supporting students uh, and expressing their identities, including their gender and sexual identities. And then also really developing what I'd call a playbook to ensure that our school leaders and, and key personnel like counselors and social workers um, have um, the protocols, the tools in place to ensure students are having equal access and opportunity to participate in programs. We also want to recognize and support the good work that's going on in schools already, including student led groups like the GSAs or Gender Sexuality Alliances. Uh, we want to focus particularly on um, targeted outreach um, and just mentioned um, in particular LGBTQ students who are homeless or at risk of home being homeless. We've done important work in our wholeness group around um, supports for homeless students and recognizing supports for this group of student, homeless students as well. And we also want to support school based initiatives and explore ways where students can feel comfortable going to particular safe zones or, zones or places in schools uh, where they can feel safe and comfortable and free from judgment. Um, I, we put up the safe zone sticker that a number of other districts have used and so we'll explore that work as well. And I should mention here that our work has been informed by what's going on in other student school districts and a variety of stakeholders and will continue to expand that benchmarking work. Let's flip to the next slide. So staff professional development will be a key part of this work. Um, we want to roll out during this 2021 school year uh, training beginning with school leaders and other key players in promoting safe and supportive environments, including such as counselors and others. There's been some significant training, but we want to deepen that work as well. And then you'll see on the slide some of the sample training objectives that we think will be important, both based on models from other districts and organizations. But we really want to do the work to make sure that we're informed by input from city school stakeholders in developing effective and uh, supportive training. Let's switch to the next slide. Um, in, in our academic work, um, we want to hold up the model of our health education curriculum, which provides lessons at all of the age, all of the levels where we do the health curriculum on treating people of all gender identities and expressions with dignity and respect. And we want to expand um, our inclusive curricular content um, across other disciplines as well to make sure we're supporting LGBTQ students um, and also ra we're raising the awareness of all students. Let's switch to the next slide. So we grouped a bunch of things together in this slide and maybe we'll uh, break out as we go along, but a couple key uh, points on data management, monitoring and communication. Uh, one is um, that and this is particularly timely in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we wanted to make sure really in response to um, questions from students and from teachers and parents that all of our virtual learning platforms appropriately are able to display students name and gender consistent with their gender identity. 
We also are working, remember the student record manual guidance that I mentioned at the beginning. We're working to clarify our protocols for student name changes and gender requests in alignment with this updated uh, guidance, as well as our student record systems to include a designation for non-binary students if students choose to identify that way. And then we want to, in the forward going work, we want to evaluate data on our current reporting processes so that that helps inform opportunities for refinement and integration of our um, sex-based discrimination processes with other school climate and equity related data and make sure that we're focusing on identifying and addressing root causes of LGBTQ student bullying and harassment along with other student bullying and harassment. And there is some data already up you can see on the MSD website that we report every year to the state on bullying and harassment, but we want to make sure that our bullying and harassment data and our data for sex-based discrimination are really aligned and then informing areas where we need to work to redouble our efforts to um, really systemically address those complaints. And then we really want to uh, identify opportunities to integrate support resources for LGBTQ students into our family and community outreach and engagement efforts at the school level and district levels, working with our communication staff to build this out. So let's go forward from there. And then finally, on the facilities design and construction front, I hope I'm not um, stealing thunder from the Ed Specs presentation later on in the agenda, but we have added gender neutral facilities to city schools updated ed specs for school construction and renovation projects really based on a student focused design developed by an in house cross office focus group that will be the model for some of the work we're doing going forward and uh, some updates here on gender neutral facilities incorporated into 21st century school projects as well as into other capital projects, including the ones at Graceland and Holabird. And then we're working, continue to work to seek funding opportunities for renovation of additional existing facilities to add gender neutral facilities, really responding to students' interest in um, and the student focused design that I mentioned above. So those are the, the key work strands and um, wanted to emphasize again in closing what Dr. Santalisi said out at the outset said that this is um, a framework. We want to really make sure that it continues to be informed by our stakeholders and we want to move beyond compliance, although compliance is important to really focus on support for all of our students um, and here our LGBTQ students as we go forward. So that was a lot to digest, but we'll open and welcome for questions and have others in the team here if uh, to chime in, including key partners in the equity office who are standing by as well. Uh, Commissioner Brooks, did you did you have your hand up or you, did you want to make a comment? You're, you're mute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just want, I wanted to um, first uh, say um, uh, thank you for putting this presentation together. Um, and I know this has come uh, from uh, a number of years of uh, in the making from community activists and um, folks all across the district um, trying to make sure that uh, Baltimore City Public Schools are a safe space for LGBTQ students. Um, and I would also like to sort of also acknowledge that um, while this presentation is really, really helpful, I feel like there's so much more to, to, to know and so much more to go and, and to do. And so um, I have a series of questions, but I'm gonna to try to just sum up in a, a, a few of them. But if you could talk to me or anybody to talk to me about uh, any current data points that we have about LGBTQ students, uh, specifically in the district, uh, regarding their academic achievement um, or their uh, experiences with bullying and harassment. So um, we do have, um, and that will be part of the JBB report that will come later in the year, but we do have data on the initial, uh, uh, the, the last year of complaints. This is the first year. And we also have the bullying data, which we want to make sure that it talks to each other. And there are a number of 
of complaints of bullying and harassment that are flagged specifically because there's a designation on the form and you want to make that sure uh, that can mark that it's discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation. So that's important to our work and it's also important to our work to make sure that um, that form continues to be accessible to all students so they can fill it out and that we respond swiftly. Um, and then I think that on the broader um, work, um, one of the bullet points that I may have skimmed over was an interest in developing surveys uh, and both qualitative and quantitative to better answer the questions that you're raising here. So thank you. So uh, again, so are you saying that we don't currently have any existing data on LGBTQ issues specific to our students beyond no. the, 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 the this form? That we have we have we have data on bullying and harassment. Um, that that is important data, and um, and as we move forward, we'll work to to flesh it out more. Great. So uh, I, this is uh, you know. So I asked this question um, partly because uh, there is data about sort of LGBT students' experiences with Baltimore City Schools through the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Yeah. So would it be yes. helpful? Would have been helpful for me to, in this process is to look specific at what's going on at the district level with our students um, and sort of what this pre presentation is missing for me is that context so i know we have this policy in place but i'm interested in so i know because i look at the data that that we our students are having issues with um uh, violent relationships they have issues with drug abuse um that they're skipping school like that is baltimore city lgbt data that is not being presented in this in this presentation. I'm trying to get a, a sense as to why that did not show up here. So we're, we're, well, we'd be happy to follow up on that data. It's a good point, and I think we can build on that going forward as well. Yeah, I, th I think, Commissioner, we can make sure that this, that as we move on um, with the work, we have consistent data points that we're referencing and benchmarking against um, with regards to actual city schools data as well as outside data. I think at least the way I had first heard your question was what is kind of city schools data that we are currently maintaining, not just all of the available data, but the work, um, which frankly cuts across a number of areas that, that we do have examples for I think at least to the point I'm hearing you make is what is also data that might reside in other places that we might not norm that we might not have previously incorporated in a full examination and in a full tracking. So I think that's some of the work represented by that last slide of the work we need to do in making that data, as I think Chief Sivan said, actually speak to one another, right? Like, so if we have data in different pockets of places, but we're not reviewing it in systematic ways, then it's not going to have the desired impact or the potential impact it could have. Yeah, and I and I, I wanted to say thank you for that. And I, I, I raised that partly because um, being a part of this district uh, and being, a, as I keep saying, a, a Black gay kid growing up in, in the city schools, um, that sometimes our narrative is often erased um, and overlooked. And I know that we're here. I know that we've always been present. And I also know that we have also systemically not shown up in support of LGBT students in this district. And so when I raise the question about sort of the data points, what I'm really trying to get at is um, visibility. Um, and so not only do I want to know what we're doing internally as a district, but also the fact that there is current existing data that talks about the, the academic achievement of our students um, who are LGBT in the district feels important um, and sort of how, who in what ways are we going to change the curriculum to be in alignment with MSD passing policy just this past year around our um, inclusive uh, sexuality education components, right? So there's these really concrete things and very specific um, deliverables that I'm just not seeing here. And I, a part of it is going to come from the work stream. So I get that. And I just want to acknowledge that, you know, I really appreciate all of that. That's the work that's been going on and putting that together. But I really wanted to sort of get some at the baseline. Sort of where are we currently? What do we currently have? So that when I see this next year, that I could see a path forward around sort of where we've grown um, and sort of what we've expanded on and sort of how we go into the next place. Um, and the next piece, um, and uh, uh, Chief Seven, 
I think you mentioned it, is particularly around our LGBT uh, staff members. Like I can't do this work as students and staff. Um, yes. and so how do we make sure that our staff are all felt supported and whole, have a mechanism for reporting issues of bullying and harassment, um, and then also that we're tracking systemically when we're hiring folks, uh, whatever the position is, that we're also paying attention to um, sexual and gender identity to make sure that we're getting um, accurate representation um, in this space. And so with that, I'll open it up to my co other colleagues to see if they have any additional questions. So um, Commissioner Brooks, this is, this is Janet. Oh. Um, I just wanted to ask, have you had an opportunity to work with um, Josh Sivens and the staff on um, some of these items that you're looking to see? Because I would love for that kind of foundation setting to happen. And then we can kind of build um, around that. That would be great, I think. And, have and, you had a chance? You and you Sorry, go ahead. OK. No, I was just asking if, he, if he's had a chance. His, his mic is on mute, so I want to want to hear his response to that. You're on mute, hon. Oh, uh, so go. no, um, I have not. I did. I had a chance to, to check in with uh, Chief Sivin uh, briefly um, before the presentation. Uh -huh. uh, and I, what we agreed to is that we will definitely be working to sort of build out okay. um, this body of work so that we could have the baseline okay. um, to move forward. Okay. Chief Simon, did you want to jump in? And oh, perfect. I just said that I, I, wel I welcome that, that the, those ideas uh, for the process and to, to filter into what we want to do, because I think that um, we want to really make sure that we're benefiting from and looking across the community. And I think that the, making sure that uh, we ensure that LGBTQ students, staff, and others uh, f feel seen and feel heard in this work. So I have said this to Commissioner Brooks privately. I will say it publicly. I really appreciate his advocacy here. And we are having conversations now because of his presence that I haven't had before on this board. And so I just want to thank you, Dr. Brooks, for your work here. And I, I really am hoping that you're able to work more closely with Josh Sivens and the team so that the final product in this will be something that can take the whole system to the next level and be and so that we can be a better support for our students, all of our students. Okay. Thank you. Um I thank see you, Commissioner Von Commissioner McFadden, did I see you earlier or you were just getting booked in? I, I just want to make sure I'm in the right order. We just getting it together, Madam Chair. I'm all, I'm all right. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Bondima has her hand okay. up, so go ahead. Yes, this is going to be very quick. And I, I think that this is the beauty of Baltimore City Public Schools Board is that having the opportunity to bring to the table people from different areas and with expertise and having uh, Commissioner Brooks on on board with, and I'm so happy to say, with plenty of experience in research, and bringing that research to the table makes a tremendous difference. And and not that we don't have the information, we don't have the information that you need, but the bottom line is his research can bring more information that we probably would not see uh, previously. And I was and before someone already said what I'm saying there. So I appreciate the fact that we have uh, Commissioner Dr. Brooks available so you can open that door and be much further ahead than any district in the state of Maryland or around the country, because that's what you bring to the table. And thanks. And I just want to say that. Thank you. Dr. Bondiva. Any other, any other comments? not. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Sivan. And um, we look forward to uh, how this plan works out in the uh, collaboration of Dr. Brooks in terms of working with you as we as we move ahead. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all. Okay. So at this point, folks, I'm going to uh, move into the consent agenda review. Uh, remember, this is not a, a time to vote. I'm going to um, uh, review the agenda. If you, uh, colleagues, if you please 
want to let me know an item that you would like to have removed and state your question uh, or, in, or um, concern for the item so that the staff can be prepared when we come back uh, to address those. Um, so the first item is 8.01, Comprehensive Maintenance Plan. Eight. I, there's a I, there's a phone that's that's and I can't tell who who it is. So if uh, okay, I'm not hearing anything. Eight point zero two educational specifications. Twelve point zero one targeted leadership consulting. Bandima, I would like to, I have a, I'm not sure if it's a question or just an explanation that um, so I needed to be explained to me. I'm not understanding some of the information that's in this, in this um, procurement. And um, it's a general, it's not even a question, but I want them to give me a brief explanation of, um, maybe I should say, I don't understand how this proposal was written without having a current or they're looking at current or prospective vendor vendors. They don't have a vendor for this amount of money. I just need the two million sixteen hundred six whatever. They, they don't have a um they okay. don't have a vendor for that amount of money. And I just need for them to explain to me what that's about. And uh, maybe it's already written somewhere, but it shouldn't take long okay. to explain. Okay. okay. And Madam Chair Yes. Madam Chair, I, with that explanation, I think it would also be helpful for um, the academics team and procurement uh, team um, to just explain a little bit more also where we are in, in regards to COVID, how um, we're being asked to approve these things, but um, it does not guarantee us having to necessarily spend um, if I'm making sense with that ex explanation. For for this particular item, is that what you're saying? For the majority of these, because most of them have the COVID explanation in them also, I think that could also support the question that Dr. Bondima is asking. So that's that's for staff that's listening. That's all, Madam Chair. Okay, I, I, I need clarification. Are you, is that just a general question that you're asking about all of the procurements? All of them that have the COVID statement attached to them, which I so believe is all of them. You need, so you want an explanation about the COVID statement, a general explanation about the COVID statement. Yes. Okay. Uh, 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 Commissioner Chenya, maybe let me make it a little bit more clear. When I read the document, when I read the procurement, I was not clear about the, the set aside of, two, of the money without having a vendor. Gotcha. And, and you see what I'm saying? Yeah, and now I, they I think the staff is hearing that part. I just wanted to make sure I got the two different pieces. Okay. Correct, okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, 12.02, Ed Scale. 12.03, Amplify Education. 12.04, Center for Applied Linguistics. 12.05, young audiences. Pull for a vote, please, Madam Chair. 12.06, learning alliances. 12.07, teach tone training. 12.08, Savas Learning Company, LLC. 12.09, North Bay Education Incorporated. 12.10, Holistic Life Foundation. 12.11, West Ed. 12.12, Community Training and Assistance Center. 12.13, L Education. What is that EL Education, sorry. 12.14, Targeted Leadership Consulting. 
12.15, engage to learn. 12.16, innovative educational programs. 12.17, International Center for Leadership and Education. 12.18, Houghton Mifflin Carport. 12.19, Teaching Matters. 12.20, Great Minds PBS con PBC Contract. 12.21, Arts Every Day. Madam Hold Chair. Uh-huh. We can pull the four vote. Four. Just for a vote? Yes. Okay. Well, I heard two voices. Is it that what the second voice is also asking? That's what I was asking. Ronald okay. Was asking for a vote? Yes. Okay. Excuse well, me, Madam Chair. Excuse I'm sorry. The one that I asked to pull, was that targeted leadership consulting? 12.01? Yes. Okay, I'm, go ahead, thank you. 12.22, Institute for Student Achievement. 14.01, Archangel Tablets, LLC. 14.02, Daily Computers Incorporated. 14.03 T-Mobile USA Incorporated. 15.01 American Tennis Courts Incorporated and P. Flanagan and Sons Incorporated Asphalt and Concrete Repair and Replacement Services. 15.02 Commercial Cabling and Sound Incorporated and Denver Ellick Incorporated. 19.01 Holistic Life Foundation Incorporated. 19.02 The Movement Team. 19.03 Continuous Growth LLC. 19.04 Concentric Education Services. 19.05 Imagine Me Ministries Incorporated. <laughs> Yeah, like Bundy, you pull that, please? Uh-huh, yes. But Bundy, 19.05. Is there a question or is this for a vote? I have a lot of questions for it. Uh, we need to let the staff know. It's just a lot of information in that, in that contract that's missing. Um, it's a lot of numbers missing, a lot of percentages not showing uh, in detail. Um, what those percentages mean, and um, and it doesn't show any uh, evidence of previous programs by this organization, the the uh, results of the programs, the, the outcomes of the programs, and okay. um, who okay. the and who the evaluator. When they say University of Maryland, uh, we'll be evaluating which University of Maryland we're talking about, and and. Um, and who's the person at University of Maryland that's evaluating the program? When you say University of Maryland, okay. it can be, okay. so it's a number of questions that I have, and they probably have the answers to it. I just, it's just not written in the, and maybe it's already there and I'm just missing it. Okay. And Madam Chair, this is Commissioner James. I would uh -huh. like to have a conversation about the separation of church and state in our procurement. All righty. Okay. So hopefully they got all that. All righty. So I have pulled at this point 12.01, uh, 12.05, which is for a vote, 12.21 for a vote, and 19.05. And there's also a general question for explanation about the COVID statements on, on uh, particular procurements, all right? So at this point, um, we will come back to those um, after public comment. Um, speakers from recognized groups will have the opportunity to speak for five minutes. And first we have uh, Joe Kane, who's chairperson of the Parent Community Advisory Board. Welcome, Mr. Kane. Good morning, Madam. Good evening, Madam Chair. Thank you for having me. So uh, good, good evening. evening and congratulations. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Happy to be here. So good evening, school board members, Dr. Santolisa, staff, 
and everyone viewing. Uh, the Parent Community Advisory Board is ready for school year 2021. Uh, we're back with new members uh, to the board and a new executive committee. I had the distinct honor of serving as chair for the school year uh, with number of, a number of other members who have a proven track record of selflessly serving uh, their school community. Uh, Linnea Cornish is serving as our vice chair. Larry Simmons is serving as our treasurer. Rachel Duncan is serving as our secretary. And Jessica Fontleroy, our outgoing chair, will be standing on for another, another two years. Other board members are Amanda Obey, Charles Smith, Courtly C.D. Witherspoon, Jessica Schiller, our principal Monique Dubai, uh, Melissa Schober, Jamae Drayton, uh, and Kiara Davis Griffin. Uh, these folk are a microcosm of one of the most valuable tools in our district toolbox of parents and community members. As parents and community members, we understand the challenges that are faced every day in a district that has been continually underfunded and attacked as a result. Uh, we understand that some of the choices aren't going to be easy and universally liked um, as others. Additionally, we know that like us, you want the best for our students here in Baltimore City. Uh, a few weeks ago, I stepped off the scale and I turned to my wife and I told her that I needed to lose some weight. I asked her to be my accountability partner. Uh, yesterday, I looked in the fridge and didn't see anything I wanted and, and said, I'm gonna call my favorite restaurant and order four wings, fries, salt, pepper, ketchup, and hot sauce, right? Um, and my wife looked at me and said, uh, I'm holding you accountable. Like she called me out on making that order. And so instead we took a walk around the lake. Uh, the Merlin legislator had decided that a group of parents and community members should serve as accountability partners to our district. Um, our role isn't to stand by the refrigerator waiting for every mistake to happen, but rather walk around the lake with you, conduct meal prep and everything in our power to support you in keeping your commitment to our children. Some days are going to be easier than others, but rest assured that everyone on our board uh, shares the same commitment to our children as you. A COVID-19 has brought the challenge of a generation. Unfortunately, there isn't a one size fit all solution to the obstacles we face as we start school in two weeks. Uh, the decision to start school virtually was the right decision, but parents still are left with questions. Um, after we're still one of the only districts that hasn't announced a full semester of distant learning. Um, as someone who started the 11th grade um, in a studio part, living in a studio apartment with my mother and three brothers, I fully understand the challenges our district face. Additionally, I know how much more difficult it would have been for my mother if she not had the uh, ability to plan uh, for long term for my brother and I, my brothers and I. Um, there are families in Baltimore facing the same dilemma my family faced 20 years ago. I hope the board considers making a long term decision sooner than later. Uh, this global pandemic has highlighted the inequities and challenges of our city. Uh, none of them has been more apparent than the digital divide. In the face of those challenges, our city has shown up for our students. Uh, the partnership between city schools, city hall, and other partners to eliminate that digital divide has been remarkable. Um, there's more work to do, but these type of relationships and partnerships is what we need to see more of in our district. Um, one partnership that we're particularly excited about is the Healing City Initiative uh, by Zeke, um, headed by Councilman Zeke Cohen. Uh, PCAB has been at the table since the, um, the onset of this initiative, and we're looking forward to Baltimore City Schools and City Hall coming together for MOU. And finally, um, for those watching, if you want to be involved in what's happening at PCAB this year, send us an email, pcab at bcps.k12.md.us. And again, thank you all for listening to our comments this evening. I look forward to any questions that you may have. Wow, thank you. I think we all, um, everybody on the board, get your sweatsuits and your sneakers and your walking shoes all ready because we are about to start heading around the lake together. Yes. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and, and again, congratulations. We look forward to being great partners with you. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Thank you. Uh, next, we thank you. Next, we have Christina Duncan Evans, who's representing the BTU. I'm looking. Uh, Duncan Evans, are you close by? Uh, 
Okay, I don't, um, I'm going to move. I know we have, um, we have uh, several folks that have uh, signed up for um, public comment. So I'm going to turn it over to the board executive for additional public comment. If Ms. Duncan Evans uh, or someone comes through, let me know and I, I, will, I will come back. Sorry, I'm just going to shoot her a quick email. Yeah, I'm going to shoot her a quick email, see if she's joining. Um, but okay. I'll, and that's and I'll go ahead and start our public comment. Uh, first up, we have a video from Ms. Uh, Rebecca Yanaway from Teachers Democracy Project. Okay, can everybody can see my screen? This summer, Teachers Democracy Project supported educators and parents in coming together at their schools to talk about the needs that families are experiencing right now. We we'll said the issues were how I'm going to work, how I'm going to work and, and educate my child, planning out ways to help with babysitting, um, to figure out who's short on food. And my school parents are coming to, together to discuss new ways for the parents to be able to get a better understanding on how to do the math. Parents are coming together to discuss online learning and ways to help families negotiate the alienation um, and logistical challenges that come with balancing school, family, and work. This work is essential because when families struggle with virtual learning, their children are less likely to engage. What was important was that people had a chance to share the issues and had a chance to connect with one another about those issues. Working together has empowered teachers, parents, and just helped to make our community stronger. We need to have the understanding that when things get hard, people show up and they help each other figure it out. We need spaces where parents can connect pair up, create pods, babysitting co-ops, or to just address their very basic emotional needs with one another. And we need the district to support them in doing that. This isn't an alternative situation. And with alternative situations, we need alternative solutions. Some students are not going to be OK just being on a laptop all day. Then what? Or they may do better having a trip to the park. We would love to see the district support our work by ensuring that school schedules take the realities that families face with online learning into consideration. Alternatives have to be available. So I think the district has to think about how to partner with all these educational facilities and organizations that we have in Baltimore. Parents would like for the district to be completely transparent when it comes to everything dealing with virtual learning and the openings so that we can know we'll have a, a, a way to actually you know prepare um, in a timely manner for us. We know that it's not possible for the district to solve every issue that families are facing right now but we would like to see the yeah. district encourage principals and community school coordinators to have conversations with parents where they can make connections with one another. Okay. All right, and then um, I've been in contact with Ms. Duncan Evans. She's on, uh, I believe she's uh, unmuting at the moment. Ms. Duncan Evans, are you unmuted? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, board chair. My name is Christina Duncan Evans, and I'm representing the Baltimore Teachers Union. I'm coming before you today to express concern over the working conditions of our school secretaries and office assistants. School secretaries were ordered to report on site at schools starting yesterday, Monday, August 24th. Previously, they had been designated to work from home. Last week and continuing into this week, there has been a lack of clear, consistent procedures being followed. Inconsistent and incomplete safety procedures put the health of our school secretaries and office assistants at risk. Additionally, many of the duties that school secretaries are being told to report for can be completed from home. Having school secretaries in school buildings sends a message to our families that they can physically gather safely at the school, despite the fact that the protocols and procedures to gather people safely in buildings 
have not yet fully been implemented. A little less than a week ago, at 10 p.m. on Tuesday the 18th, school secretaries and office assistants were emailed instructions to report to schools on the 24th. Since that time, school secretaries have reached out to the BTU leadership with questions, questions that could not be answered by their administrators or had not been answered by central office leadership. Questions such as, what are those with pre-existing conditions supposed to do? Why is the building all of a sudden safe next week when it's clear that there are surfaces and areas that have been untouched and uncleaned since the spring? Will every secretary be provided with a plexiglass partition? What will our hours be? Why do administrators get to trade off being in the building, but secretaries have to report every day? Some front offices do not have windows and adequate ventilation. What proof do we have that there is sufficient ventilation to release potential contaminated air? And so on and on and on. Less than 48 hours after the announcement was made, we had collected dozens of questions from school secretaries. Each question that came to BTU demonstrates a gap where the plan as communicated by the district has fallen short. Any plan that attempts to reintroduce physical contact into our schools should not have this many gaps. While some of our questions were answered in the weeks that followed the announcement, many questions have not been answered at all. Some questions were answered and then retracted. Some answers were given, and then subsequently those answers were shown to be incomplete or inaccurate. This has led to an extremely chaotic and challenging week for our school secretaries, who ironically are brilliant at logistics and operations. If our school secretaries had actually helped with the formation and execution of this plan, it would be nowhere near as confusing and inconsistent. The topic that has been the most challenging and concerning has been the question of leave and accommodations. Many of our school secretaries and office assistants have health conditions or other factors that make working in a public facing job an additional risk. Right now, the district has not completed the process of identifying high risk individuals and providing them with the accommodations they need. Many secretaries are still waiting for a response to their accommodation. Despite this, Principals have said that they are not allowed to permit their front office staff to work from home. However, just yesterday, union leadership was informed by central office staff that people waiting for a response should stay home, but this still has not been communicated directly to employees. The school secretaries of Baltimore City just want to serve their families, students, and communities. We believe they should be as safe as possible while doing their work and that they need clear information and directions in order to work effectively. Many of the tasks that school secretaries are being asked to do can be done from home. The main reason given that school secretaries and office assistants need to report to buildings was that too many calls to the building were going to voicemail. However, bringing school secretaries back into schools wouldn't solve that problem. A school's main office line rings directly to secretary's cell phones, so calls are answered in real time. If people are getting voicemail, it's because the secretary is on the line with another call. Having secretaries take calls from the school building as opposed to their home wouldn't change the fact that the phone line goes to voicemail sometimes. Adding more staff to front offices would keep phone calls from going to voicemail. If you're not going to increase the number of people responding to school calls, Changing the secretary's location won't make that much of a difference. The only difference it makes is that it encourages families to go to the buildings to speak with a real person instead of staying in their homes safer and getting their issues resolved with a phone call. The decision to have front office staff refer, return to building is more performative than substantive. Although we've received many concerns, time does not permit me to discuss. The final concern I'd like to bring up Affects our, that affects our secretaries are their plexiglass barriers. Across the district, we have received several concerning accounts of the installation of plexiglass barriers intended to keep secretaries safer. We've heard of plexiglass barriers that are installed to hang from the ceiling and leave a four inch gap between the desk and the plexiglass. We've heard of plexiglass falling down after it was installed. Just today, I've been sent pictures of plexiglass barriers that are not affixed to the desk. 
They are freestanding, the way that a bookend sits on a shelf. The barriers have gaps both at the bottom, between the desk and the barrier, and where the barriers meet. These barriers are very concerning because these types of barriers will eventually be needed for all desks where people are interacting in all classrooms and office suites. Additionally, secretaries were told to pick up PPE by August 20th. Their PPE allocation was two masks and a face shield, and no additional information has gone out about how and when they will be given more. On behalf of the secretaries, office assistants, and the BTU teachers, PSRPs, clinicians, and central office staff that stand behind them, we are requesting that secretaries and office assistants work from their homes until safety protocols and procedures are in place and can be implemented with fidelity. As a final note, the first day of professional development for 10-month employees is tomorrow, and as of right now, staff has not received a start time or a link to answer to access their professional development. Instead, we've been told that that information will be shared tomorrow. As you continue to assess the efficacy of your practices, per the CEO's comments tonight, we ask that these self-assessments of efficacy be shared with the people who are depending on city schools, your staff, families, students, and communicate, uh, community members. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ms. Duncan Evans. Mr. Gay, do we have another comment? Yes, yes, we do. Um, next up, we have Mr. Jabari Lyles. Is Jabari on the phone? Hey, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay, awesome. Um, so, so good to see many of you. I hope everyone is, is well and safe. Um, and for those who don't know me, my name is Jabari. I work in the mayor's office as Mayor Young's Director of LGBTQ Affairs. Um, in that role, I support and advise the mayor and city government on needs and opportunities concerning the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community. Um, I'm also a very proud former city teacher. Um, and so in my work, I care very deeply about LGBT young people and how they fare in our city schools. Um, so starting off, it was really refreshing to see the report earlier this uh, tonight. Um, you know, I started my advocacy work with city schools in 2009. And so uh, to see that 10 years later, we're finally seeing a presentation that talks in a very comprehensive way about LGBT student affirmation is really exciting. Um, I've been doing some great work with the Office of Equity and the Office of Legal Counsel to collaborate on much of what you saw tonight. Um, on that presentation, and um, I just offer my uh, very full attention and collaboration to this work. Um, wanted to just highlight tonight about, uh, you know, a lot of this work was done before COVID, and now that we live in this new virtual world, this work is just as urgent, uh, but looks differently. We know that many LGBT students, um, they possibly are at home with parents and guardians who are not affirming of their identity, which puts them in a possible, you know, hostile and unsafe position, school uh, for many of these young people was uh, a safe haven or break away from being away from families um, who are hostile to their identity and now they have to be there 24 seven. Uh, we also know that many LGBT students or teachers might get a break from school, a break from uh, bullying harassment. Um, at any rate, I would urge the board to think about in the, in, uh, in the immediate time, um, what are those ways we can talk about LGBT affirmation in this new virtual world, looking at making sure young people have access uh, to uh, displaying their proper names and pronouns, making sure that teachers are equipped with uh, recognizing the signs and symptoms of young people who are in possibly abusive or neglectful situations. We've seen an increase in intimate partner violence and domestic violence uh, reports. And so I know that LGBT young people are suffering from some of those same things. Um, and I'm just helping young people generally cope and connect during this uncertain time. Um, and so I'm really excited to continue the, the, the long-term work, but I think, you know, what does uh, looking at a current plan to equip teachers with the resources and knowledge to get this virtual school year started strong and making sure that LGBT youth are uh, thought about. Um, I also want to mention that uh, the current form online for reporting for policy JBB um, is really cumbersome for a young person to navigate. It currently is a link that goes to board docs that you have to print. Um, it's not provided in Spanish. 
Um, and so this is something that I've suggested before about having an online form or something that's a little bit more easy for young people to navigate. It's very cumbersome. Um, and lastly, I'll mention that October is LGBTQ History Month. Um, I think it's a really incredible opportunity for city schools to be visible and vocal about their solidarity to LGBT young people. Um, today, city schools is not seen as a very visible or vocal partner in this work. Um, and so I think that LGBT History Month, uh, as well as National Hispanic Heritage Month and other days of recognition, uh, are really easy opportunities to provide educational resources um, and district-wide campaign and communi communication efforts to really show visibly that you are uh, walking side by side with LGBT students and families. Um, so I'm really excited about the work uh, to continue. I'm glad to see some of you in this weird way, um, and I'm on board to be a partner. Uh, so thank you for the work that uh, you're doing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lyles. We look forward to uh, continuing our collaboration with you. Thank you. Mr. Gann is there. Was there a third person? Sorry, this was a little slow with the unmuting. Uh, we have one final person, Ms. Angie okay. Winder. Ms. Angie Winder, are you on? Hold on, let me see if her phone number is listed. Uh, Ms. Winder, I see you on. You have to unmute yourself. You can also hit star, um, asterisk, star six. If, that, if you're, um, the regular unmute is not working, but I do see you on. Hello, this is Angie Winder. Yes, we hear you. Thank you. I had to do the star six. I'm sorry. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Angie Winder. Um, I just wanted to come on here. It's actually going to be a little different because um, earlier I did hear the appointment of some principals and yet um, Mervo was not listed. So my... Um, my comment is a little different now. Um, one thing I want to say is uh, just on behalf of the Mervo Alumni Association and the community and Mervo community, I want to one just say thank you for listening. I'm not sure where it's even going at this moment, but it was kind of breath, um, you know, it was kind of good to actually not hear the appointment yet when there were still a lot of concerns and questions. Um, so one, thank you to everyone, the school board, Dr. Santelisi, um, again, everyone, just thank you for listening. Uh, we actually had an online petition. There are um, almost 800 signatures from alumni and community members. I'm sure you've already seen our letters, so I don't want to kind of do that, uh, you know, put anything out. But I do want to say, again, thank you. I also want to just see if there were any updates as school will begin tomorrow um, for teachers and staff, and yet um, they are unaware of what the direction as far as their leadership at the school at this moment. Not sure if that can be spoken on now and or if we can um, kind of go back to the square one and uh, find our leader uh, for the school. But we want to make sure, and I hope that we've made you know our voice is clear that we want to be a part of this process and um i believe that you know even with me being chosen to speak on behalf of the alumni association i was also the former ptsa president at mervo um, i'm on the board for the alumni association and i'm on the school family council um, i was on there when they previously um appointed their previous uh principal i'm sorry as well as this last time and so i just wanted to just say that there were a lot of flaws um, that needs to be addressed um, going forward. Um, even earlier today, I, I was actually appointed as a, um, a, a, a board member, I would say, um, for the for PCAD. So it's very strong um, for me to make sure that I'm a voice for my community, for our youth, um, as we're going forward with a um, distant learning. I think it's very important to have someone that will be boots on the ground, someone who's already aware of the situation and um, will make sure that our scholars continue to uh, strive. Uh, we're very much involved and love our community as well as the community um, that's surrounding the school. And we just wanted to just, again, say thank you for this evening, uh, for not appointing someone at this moment. Not sure, again, if we can get an update as the um, last meeting was on August the 11th, where there was a closed session 
Um, and I just would like to know if there's any way that we can get an update and or a special meeting with the CEO or um, just another appointment, um, principal selection interview. And thank you again for listening to me. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ms. Randall. What, what I'm going to ask is, because as you mentioned, this is a personal issue, but um, I think if we have your, uh, Mr. Gann has your phone number in terms of what the status is, I'm going to ask that um, we'll, we'll, we will take care of somebody contacting you uh, for that piece of it. But as you said, we can't discuss um, the, um, the full personnel actions and, and things here in public. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I believe that was the last person we had for public comment. Am I correct, Mr. Gant? Yes, it was. Okay, so um, with that, I'm going to uh, ask uh, the board members, uh, based on public comment, if there are any additional items that board members would like um, to pull from the consent agenda. And if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So move, Frank. Thank you. Is there a second? Bundima second, second. Richardson. Uh, okay, I heard Bundima first, so I'll go there. <laughs> Those in favor, uh, Commissioner Bundima? Yes. Okay, Commissioner Brooks? Yes. Commissioner Frank? Yes. Commissioner James? Yes. McFadden? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner Richardson? Yes. Commissioner Roberts? Yes. And I'm in favor. Um, no, no one is opposed, no one has abstained. So we have nine in favor uh, the, for the, the consent agenda has been approved. So now we're going to go back to the items that were pulled. Um, And uh, first one, uh, first is I'm going to ask if um, uh, there could be the the uh, explanation that was requested around the the, the COVID uh, statements on some of the uh, items. And yeah, this is Joe Vogel, the interim director of procurement. What we try to do with agenda items that we're bringing to the board in this current situation is to assume that we will be back in schools uh, in buildings sooner than, than later. So we make that assumption and that is where we then estimate what that dollar figure might be. Uh, in those cases where we're not going to be back in the building and some vendors cannot perform virtually, uh, then we will obviously not be able to give them purchase orders so the actual expenditure uh, will not be as high as you see. So we're trying to plan for the, the, the what if. Commissioner McFadden, does that, does that help you? Yes, I just wanted that to be made clear again. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the first uh, pulled item was 12.01 uh, targeted leadership consulting and uh, uh, Commissioner Bondima, I believe, has some questions. Hi, Hi. Dr. Funker. Hey there. Good to Hi. see you, Dr. Bondima. Um, I, uh, can I, you want to speak ahead. first? You want me to go first? Go ahead. Um, thank you so much. I, when I read it, it sounds it sound a little bit different. And I just couldn't see, and you can explain to me, and I'm sure we talk, you do an excellent job explaining. Um, for $2 million, a little over $2 million, it doesn't look like you had a set agenda or a set project for the amount of money that you're setting aside. And I'm not clear about, I've never seen it where you, you, you haven't identified any um, vendors and you're creating a, uh, projects that ha that needs to be done with money that you're using but you haven't zeroed in on how much money you're going to be using for each vendor and you haven't selected a vendor i'm not clear about it. just explain that to me sure so i think that what might be a little bit confusing is that at the beginning of um the letter 
what you're reading um, where it talks about the purpose of this pre-qualified selection or PQS is to identify current and prospective vendors. Um, that's the overall frame for what this letter is, but the vendor that we are have selected is targeted leadership consulting. So that's the group that's being referred to throughout this letter. Um, and the work that we are asking them to do is tied to our ninth grade initiative, specifically our, we're calling it on track work because it's work that's focusing on using early warning indicators to track where our ninth graders are in terms of being on track with what they need in order to graduate. Um, that's mm -hmm. based on a lot of the research that's looked at attendance at student behavior and looked at student course completion and said that if we can help students get on track in ninth grade, we increase their chances of graduating significantly. And so what targeted leadership is offering is the opportunity for schools to purchase essentially coaching, right? So we are running this ninth grade initiative across the district in all of our high schools. We've set the expectations that there will be teacher teams and leadership teams that are working through uh, support for our ninth graders, knowing our students well and knowing how we need to support each of them individually. And what targeted leadership um, is offering is professional development training, um, both for the district team and for school-based teams that schools could um, that schools could opt into, where there would be coaching on how to actually implement this initiative on the school level, given their context. Does that provide a little bit more information for you? You did a lot. You did well. I um, I. You put a lot of emphasis on ninth graders when you talk, you just presented. I didn't get that in the um, I saw where ninth graders were mentioned, mm -hmm. but I didn't get the scope of what all that you will be doing with ninth graders and um, and I think that I was missing something, and I mentioned before that I must be there, but maybe I didn't, I didn't get it. But now I kind of understand a little bit more. Okay. So the, this organization is the one that's going to be getting the money, right? That's right, and they would get money specifically for coaching. But we can have schools who we will have schools who will be running this ninth grade work because all our high schools will be doing it, and they may not opt in to have targeted leadership provide that coaching, and that's that's absolutely fine. Um, we just wanted to provide them as a resource to schools that wanted additional support. And these students will be getting this on site. Is that right? Or uh, these students will be getting it in whatever format we are in at a given time. So right now uh, we will be organizing to support freshmen virtually. And in fact, many schools had uh, summer bridge programs for incoming freshmen that they ran over the summer and did it virtually and made connections with parents and with students. And that's all part of that ninth grade work. And then when, you know, whenever we move into a hybrid setting, we'll continue that work there in that setting as well. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Pfeiffer. You're welcome, thank you. All right, if there, are there any other, no other questions? Are we um, ready to vote for, on this particular item? Is there, is there a motion? Um, uh, in favor of 12.01, targeted leadership consulting? So moved by me. So moved. Uh, Bandima, I'm sorry. Uh, Bandima and seconded by Richardson. Richardson, okay. So I'll go through for those who are those in favor. Uh, Commissioner Bandima? Yes. Uh, Brooks? Yes. Okay. Frank? Yes. James? Yes. McFadden? Yes. Reed? Aye. Richardson? Yes. Roberts? Madam Chair, I'll be abstaining from this vote. Uh, okay, so Chinya um, is in favor and, and Roberts is an abstention. Okay, so we have eight in favor and one abstaining. So this mo uh, this um, motion is approved. This procurement is approved. Thank you. The next one that was pulled is 12.05 and it was, it was for the vote only. It's my understanding. 
So is there a motion to approve uh, item 12.05? So moved, Richardson. Okay, is there a second? Second, McFadden. Thank you. Okay, and those in favor, bon uh, Commissioner Bondima? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Okay, Commissioner Frank? Yes. Uh, Commissioner James? I'm abstaining. Okay, Commissioner uh, McFadden? Yes. Uh, Reed? Yes. Commissioner Richardson? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Roberts? Madam Chair, I'll be abstaining. Okay. Um, and I am in favor. So we have um, seven uh, in favor and two abstentions. So this um, uh, procurement is also approved. The next one that was pulled is um, 12 point. Do I have the right one? 12.21, is that correct? For a vote? That was arts every day? That is correct. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so is there a motion to approve this item? So move, Frank. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Richardson. Thank you. And I'll do the vote for approval. Uh, Commissioner Bondima? Yes. Uh, Brooks? Yes. Okay. Frank? Yes. James? Abstaining. Okay. McFadden? I'm abstaining. Uh, Reed? Yes. Richardson? Yes. Roberts? Madam Chair, I'll be abstaining. Okay, and I'm in favor um, that we have six in favor and three abstentions. I believe this one also has been approved. The last item is 19.05. Imagine me and there were uh, several questions for this one also. This was um, both Commissioner Bondina and Commissioner uh, James. Okay, questions. thank you, Commissioner. I was really um, concerned about this this particular proposal. But one thing I tried to do some little research on it, and it doesn't list that it has a director. I like to, if it does, I'd like to know who's the director of this program. In addition to that, um, it says it's being evaluated by University of Maryland, uh, but it didn't go into detail. University of Maryland could be any University of Maryland in the state of Maryland. So who is the who is the evaluator for this program? In addition to that, one thing that, and I guess you've probably heard me say this before, I have a lot of problems with with percentages when one shows percentages of, of, of participants or information, because when you show percentage, you're not showing the exact number. A percentage could be, you could have five people and 100% could be five. So, and people have listened to me before and usually come to the table with numbers. In addition to that, it said that the mint one thing uh, outcome of, of of previous program that you've had, well, they've had um, several of the students continue to have a mentor after nine years. But to show several students, se when you say several, what does several mean? Um, what what are the numbers? And then again, um, maybe you can explain to me uh, when you say it's going to be working with five hundred students or You've had 500 students in the program. One thing that people have done, and everybody and all of you guys are pretty experienced with it, with this, when you have had 500 students in a previous program with this particular program, you might start with 500. Very, very, very seldom do you end up with 500. And the sad part about programs, when you're working with this different, any school system, you might end up with 100 at the end. And, and to be really honest with you, a lot of times you don't end up with 100, and we all know that. So, and then I would like to have seen, and maybe this can come later, I would like to see comments made from parents and students who have participated, because I'm all for programs that dealing with girls. 
is wonderful when you can do that. But I would like to have seen um, comments made about the program. Uh, with, it, it was if if you were a reader, a federal reader of a program, this would not pass because it's not enough information. And that's not saying you can make you can make it go. But I'm just saying there's so many questions in here that I'm really concerned with. And maybe you can answer those questions then. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll go ahead. So I'll start from the beginning. The director is Pasha Lee. Pasha Pei Lee is the director. And they are currently getting their program evaluated by the University of Maryland School of Social Work. It is being researched by Dr. Hemingberger, Dr. Angela Hemingberger, and then Dr. Vashana Mushonga. I'm going to hope that I pronounced that correctly. Um, if you would like for me to give you um, that information, I can definitely make sure I'll follow up in writing so you can have those specific researches as well. Um, in terms of the numbers that were listed in the um, proposal, those were 66 students who were a part of the program were given that post survey. Um, so based upon that, I'm trying to go back to the letter. Um, out of that um, 70, I'm trying to find the letter. That was done in 2018 for 66 of the young girls who were participating in the program. And that was for all of the students who were at one particular school. I'm not sure if I can state the exact school that that was at, but it was one particular school. And I can definitely give you the additional follow up information for that as well. Um, there were other questions you had. Did I answer them all? I feel like I still missed one. The um, research study, the they were hoping to have the data produced in July of this school year. It started in February, but of course, due to COVID, they had to pause. So of course, they will reconvene with the study as soon as they are given the green light to start again. I will share that this program was able to continue in the spring. And as a part of their program, they were able to give their young ladies a laptop that was given through a donation from an outside organization. They were also able to provide them STEM kits as well as journals and yoga mats. And the young ladies, when they signed on, were able to engage in health and fitness. They were able to do science. And then for the high school young ladies, they were also able to engage in weekly sessions around college prep and study skills. Um, can I ask a question? The 66 yeah. students you said that were in the program, of those 66 students that started the program, right? How yes. many students completed the program? I do not have those specific numbers. I would have to go back and ask them directly how many completed the program of that number. But And back to what I was asking before, I don't want to interrupt you, please. If you, no, it's fine. Go ahead. Okay, of the students that when I was talking about that were had mentors for nine years. How many of those students that started that continue with mentors throughout for nine years? How many students are you documented that the complete that worked with mentors for nine years? How many would you say? Because you just said several, several could be three. Yes, that's a very good question. So they have that there were 15 of their young ladies who kept their mentor over nine years. Uh, 15? Yes. Out of, out of? 15 out of the, they have currently served over 500 young young ladies in our schools. So 15 of them have kept their mentoring relationship nine or more or close to nine years. Okay. Uh, I, I just need to say that I'm not saying that this is not a wonderful program. You need to infuse some information in there and just, you know, not assume that the board can guess at the rest of it. You know what I mean? Yes. Because when you look at the numbers, we look at numbers and we evaluate the whole project. And when you talk about the amount of money that's involved in it, we need to know how many students start, the, all of the participants, and who responded to your data, your survey, and the end product, the outcome of the program. 
because you're talking about a large amount of money, okay? And we all know, and you've ran programs, you know when you start with one amount, what do you end with? Sometimes you end with one, and I've seen that happen. So I think that is a great idea. We always want programs to deal with girls and guys, but to me, it's just so much missing from this document, and maybe it's already there and I'm missing it. You can help me with that. Yes, absolutely. So many of the young ladies, particularly when they're starting in sixth grade, continue through on to eighth grade. So while only that 15 may have extended beyond those years that they were in middle school, 50% uh, of their young ladies continue on for the duration of the year. And then they're also able to continue and have those young ladies participate in the program through sixth through eighth grade. They also have uh, on a yearly basis, the mentors are able to attend a banquet in which they're able to bring all of the mentors over the, that they have supported and served over the past 13 years. And the young ladies are able to come back and able to share sort of their stories and their connections with the young ladies that are currently in the program as well. So it's quite an extensive program and you're right. We probably did not include as much information in the letter for you to get the full scope of the support and services that they provide. And I do have, you said you would like to have heard some quotes. I was able to pull up the proposal for you. Well, and, oh. you don't really have to do that right oh. now. We just, I'm gonna move it along. The one thing that I do wanna emphasize, the worst thing in the world is to come to the table and say several, a percentage. It would be, your, your pay, it will go through so much quicker. We need numbers because several, most of all of that to me means absolutely zero. If but when you start putting those numbers to it, it's like wow, that's what we want to hear, or at least I, as a board member, want to hear. Yes, but absolutely. Not you off, but that the numbers are critical. Yes. Okay. So they do I, have. I can give you a strong number that they have a ninety percent retention rate for the young ladies that are starting in their sixth grade through eighth grade in their middle school program. 90% remain for that duration of that middle school year. But you didn't give me, when you said 90% out of the, the beginning, with yes. the whole the whole amount, 90% sounds great, but how many started with, and 90% of what? You see, you see, you get what I'm saying? Yes. So the 90% really out of 10, how much is 90% out of 10 people? Right. So they so they are able to service 40 students per year. So in that number, in that in each year that they're serving at a school, 90% of those students remain on for six well, through how eight. How many schools? So currently they are in hold on. So let me 40 hear. out of how many? Okay. Yeah, but anyway, you can. You, I'm not gonna hold you like that. I'm. I'm just saying. When you say 40 out of each school, how many schools are we talking about? Four schools. Okay. You see, so you said, and like you, you could have said 40 schools. I'm just, you know, the yes. numbers are critical, really. Thank might, you. Might I make a might I make a suggestion? And I know that um, Commissioner um, James also had a question. Um, is it possible, and I'm I'm just gonna just just my just a suggestion that perhaps we hold this uh, to the next meeting, and if you could rewrite the portions given the uh, the the information uh, and the recommendations that you're getting from from Commissioner Bondima, so that we have a a, a more complete picture, uh, that might be the better way for us rather than trying to do it all right now. Sure, absolutely. Okay, and, and then looking at the start date, that would still give you, I mean, it, it could still be approved in time for the, for the around the start date. I, a little past, but we could take care of that piece. Yes, I can do okay. that. Absolutely. Okay, thank, okay. thank you. I, yes, okay. absolutely. Then I know Commissioner James also had a question. I want to make sure that one is given so that you can include that in terms of uh, any any revisions that need to be done. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Stokes, um, two quick questions for you. Yeah. One, to continue um, on the questions around numbers that Commissioner Bondima brought up. Um, in 2018, it showed that you had a $30,000 contract with city schools, and now you're going to a $430,000 contract. One of the challenges we know with mentoring organizations in expanding capacity is finding and recruiting mentors. 
so I so I'd love you and and you don't have to mention now, but if you could talk about how you're going to bring that from, you know, if you were 40 students at a school in four schools and that was thirty thousand dollars, what is four hundred and thirty thousand dollars as far as as impact? You know, numbers of students, numbers of schools you're trying to get to and numbers of mentors and where will you recruit them from? Yes, so this organization gets their mentors from Maryland Mentors. And then they also have um, many of the teachers who are at the schools that they're working with then also volunteer to be mentors as well. So if, if you could just say how you're going to get to capacity in that in your um, explanation, that would be great. And the other part that that is concerning to me is that we do have a value of separation of church and state in this country. And this is a, a ministerial oriented uh, mentoring program. So if you could talk about how you how you separate that, um, how you welcome non Christians into the organization, that would be um, beneficial to me as well. And again, you don't have to answer it now, um, but if you could in the proposal, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, it is a registered nonprofit, um, and so when we review this, we reviewed it for its mentor capacity and its ability to be able to support students with social emotional learning and development of those skills. And so, in that proposal, this program does not push forth any religious ideals, and they do not push forth any religious programming for students at all. But I will definitely make sure that I will update that. The website would say otherwise. So. And again, not anti-God, not anti-religion, just making sure that we're doing due diligence on, on keeping everybody in their lane. Yes, absolutely. I will Thank be sure you. to update in the letter. Okay. Just one more question. Yes. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, is it okay? Just Go one ahead. more. Where did you come up with um, $125 an hour? How did you come up? And did I see the right thing when they, for, for the teacher's salary? If I look at the wrong one, yeah, I'm looking at the right one. $125 an hour. So this would be based upon each organization is asked to submit um, their submit a proposal for how much it would cost based upon the hours and then based upon the hours per day and the numbers of students that they would serve. So I have to go back directly into the proposal to see the exact numbers that this organization put forth to get forth to get the 125 per hour. Thank if you. If that needs to be clearer in the letter, I can make sure we will articulate that a little clearer. Please show evidence where you got that information from. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So I think you have quite a few um you know things that we need to have much more clarity on and then we we will table this um to the to the next um board meeting if you want to uh submit a, re a, re a revised letter for us yes absolutely okay. yeah well thank you. thank you okay thank you okay so i think we've um that was the last of the procurements folks and i'm going to move back to um see if they if uh, if our uh, board committees would like to do any um, updates or report outs and so I will start with the teaching and learning committee Commissioner McFadden Madam Chair I don't uh, have a, a particular update I mean the I don't have one just our next upcoming meeting you'll announce that at the end of the meeting okay thank you um, operations committee Commissioner Roberts. Um, I'll mirror, I will mirror Commissioner McFadden's statement. Um, I don't have any updates, <laughs> uh, okay. but our next meeting is September 15th. Thank you. And uh, policy, Commissioner Brooks. Yes, so I would just uh, like to say um, we had a wonderful uh, presentation um, at our last policy meeting. Um, we <clears throat> explored two uh, policies, new policies that are been in development, and one revision and uh, one new policy. Um, and just really wanted to invite um, participants to come in and really weigh in on um, those uh, uh, policies um, and to really help us to, in, to be informed in, this, in that space. So this is a, a place where we can um, continue to sharpen and make sure the policies are actually effective um, and the types of policies that we need to move uh, the district forward. 
Um, and uh, just really uh, grateful for uh, the space and, um, and it's really an open invitation uh, to continue to help us uh, shape policy uh, that will last uh, for a number of years to come. Okay. And so just for everyone's um, information, um, as was mentioned, the Teaching and Learning Committee uh, will have its next meeting on Tuesday, September the 1st at 3.30. These are all virtual meetings. Uh, operations on Tuesday, September the 15th at 10.30 a.m. And policy Tuesday, September the 15th at 3.30 p.m. Um, and the um, next um, meeting for the board uh, will be on Tuesday, September the 8th. That should be a date that everybody has in their heads because I know that that is also the first day of school. Um, so um, after everything is done uh, for one part of the day, you can join us um, at 5 p.m. for the uh, for the board meeting at that time. Is there um, any any other item for the good of the group that a board member needs to bring up before I ask for a motion to adjourn? Madam Chair. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jonette. Oh, no, I was just going to say the PCAP meeting also. I didn't want you to forget oh, to mention that. I'm sorry. Yes, I didn't flip my page. Sorry about that, PCAP. And we're walking with you, so I got to make sure I tell everybody. <laughs> Thursday, September the 17th at 6.30 p.m., uh, mm -hmm. another virtual meeting and an open invitation to join us. Sorry. Uh, Madam Chair, there are two birthdays I'd like to acknowledge. We haven't met since. Uh, Dr. Santelisis's birthday earlier this month. Um, so happy birthday belated to Dr. Santelisis and also to Commissioner Roberts. Commissioner Roberts just celebrated a birthday last oh. week. So I just wanted to make sure we acknowledge happy those wonderful birthday. women. <laughs> Great. Happy birthday <laughs> to all of you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed them. And um, thank you, Commissioner in the midst of all all of all of the things that were happening and um i would just like again like to uh thank everyone um who has been uh in any way supporting and helping as we have uh tried to plan and get ready for the opening of school to to uh to teachers who are returning and staff who are returning tomorrow our thoughts will be with you as you begin um, that process of of a lot of professional development to be ready for students, uh, for parents. I know that you're starting getting your students ready for the routine of, you know, the right bedtime and the time to get up in the morning and be able to, uh, to look at the screen or to look at you or whomever. <laughs> uh, but thank you all uh, for that. Know that, as we said earlier, uh, we, will, we will always be uh, there to listen. We need to hear from you. Um, as we continue monitoring um, whatever plan we have in place as, as we're going through the implementation. We know we must, we must be flexible, um, we must be supportive, and we must collaborate. And so with that, I'm going to ask if there's a motion to adjourn. So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Second, Madden, there's Commissioner second. James. Okay, James. Uh, if there is no objection from the, from the board, I'm going to take this by consent that we will adjourn. <laughs> yes. Have a good night, everyone. See none. Have a good evening and thank you, All everyone. Right.